Welcome to Pirate Living Podcast. We are your hosts, Karan and Kristen. On this podcast, we are highlighting ordinary people living extraordinary lives. These are pirates who take small, bold actions daily to create social change. Pirate life is all about rebelling and breaking the rules for good. Creating lasting social change starts by first breaking our inner rules. After all, the hardest rules to break are your own. The pirates we highlight have dedicated themselves to creating good trouble. Today we are chatting with Crystal Eisinger. Crystal is causing good trouble and getting people around her to question the status quo. Crystal has been taking small, bold actions to create changes around her. And if you've read the book, How to Be More Pirate, you will have read about her piracy within the Navy of Google. Crystal is now charting her own course and raising her flag of rebellion. And we are thrilled to be chatting with you today. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I can't wait to talk to you both. I love the podcast. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, you've been creating good trouble all in the world around you. So will you tell us about what led you on your pirate journey? Yes. What led me on my pirate journey? I think some of some part of it was probably implicit and some required some more external nudging in the right direction. I think from an internal perspective, there was a part of me that always wanted to push for more or push for change. I never saw hierarchy wherever I was, whether that be teachers within school in a good way, but also partners within the, you know, the consultancy firm where I really cut my teeth in my professional career. I just never saw there as being a hierarchy. I just saw them as people. And I think that meant that I felt like I could be very honest and have a two-way conversation where I didn't see a power dynamic. So I think that part of me that I don't know whether I would call it rebellion. So at that stage, but limitless possibility whereby we have the power to create change was something that started from a very young age through not seeing that hierarchy from an external perspective I heard um, from an external perspective I met Sam when I was on the marketing academy scholarship and when he first came and spoke to us he had just launched or relatively recently launched the first Be More Pirate book and I have to be honest I judged it a little bit too quickly I was like oh yeah it kind of says what it's does what it says on the tin, I get it. And this sounds stunty and great, but I didn't really realize the profound impact it would have on my life after that point. So the first talk was great. Sounds an incredible speaker. I was bought into the idea in general. And then as lots of things happen like this in my life, it takes a little while for things to bed in for me to like realize the actual impact that they're having on my life in some way. And so I think I'm trying to think about the specific moment. So I had was asked to do a presentation in the graduation effectively of this cohort that I was part of called the Marketing Academy. And I asked Sam if we could record a video together because he wasn't in town the night that the ceremony was going to happen. And I typically would have done a question and answer session. So instead he came to Google and we recorded the whole thing. And I started to understand the concepts at a deeper level and having that one-on-one time together awakened something in me, if you like. And I think it gave me license, I guess if I'd say it in one sentence, reading the book, researching the book in order to do that video with him gave me license to be a difficult woman and embrace that part of myself, which I think over the last probably five years, I'd started to press down a little bit. So I was very proud and felt like not seeing hierarchies was a good thing and speaking out and championing things was good. There was probably a point where I started to feel a bit worn down and suppress those things a little bit. And then reading the book, properly with a research mindset speaking to Sam going through that process then made me feel like I should shed my corporate layers a little bit and try and be a bit more comfortable with being that difficult voice which is something I think over time you're told not to not to do or be in order to succeed yeah I think especially as women we're told not to be difficult <laughs> You're not to take up space or be too loud and you have to be the good girl. Um, So how did that, after um, 
those that conversation with uh, with Sam. Uh, what steps did you take after that? How did that change your life? So there are a couple of things. One is that I think it gave me a vocabulary to describe. Sorry, hold on. Can I just turn off all my um, mm -hmm. yeah. bits so that this doesn't keep happening? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> question was. Like, how did things change after that conversation and those those realizations that you had? Yeah, so um, things started to change, firstly, because I had a vocabulary to describe what was important to me, a label that wasn't being difficult, because I don't <laughs> think that sounds particularly attractive. And instead, instead, I started to frame it in terms of a language of, you know, being more pirate as being a core part of my identity and causing good trouble as being a part of my value system. And the other thing that I did at the same time was started to use my position in Google to have lots of workshops and bring pirate language into Google. So I think in some ways that also anchored the language that I was using to describe what I was trying to do in separate ways, whether that be how we launch something internally, how we communicate about something internally. At the time, I remember I was launching a brand new sales team and I wanted to do it in a way that hadn't been ever done before. And I kept saying, we need to do this in a more pirate way. Um, we need to think about the rest of Google as the Navy. How do we create this pirate group? And so myself having a language to describe it and then bringing Be More Pirate into Google and specific teams I work with then allowed me to have a bit more license to create that change. And I think then it also just became a bigger part of my identity more broadly. Um, I probably had the courage. I, I think I described it actually at the time as I started to use Be More Pirate as a cloak, an invincibility cloak that I wore all the time that made me think if I feel slightly uncomfortable or nervous about something because I'm worried that it's not the right thing to say or it might be difficult, then you should then I should go ahead and do it. Mm. if it feels difficult then then you know I think there was a slogan that Sam had which was like if it's a no go which wasn't the one that I particularly liked but if it feels hard it means that you're doing it right mm. and that's something that I consistently kept core to my values the whole way through if it feels like it's a difficult conversation to have it's a it's a conversation worth having mm -hmm. and that meant then I started being a bit bolder in terms of the things that I was doing the things I was taking a stand on both internally and externally. Um, and, and also I just, it became, a, I started to become associated with it, which for good or for bad, um, but that's probably how it, yeah, how it became a broader part of my life. What were some of those changes that you brought in to uh, when you were working at Google? So when I was at, working at Google, as I said, one of the things I really vividly remember was launching this new uh, sales team from scratch with uh, one of the, one of the directors that I work very closely, an amazing man called Phil Miles. And we said, right, we're going to do this differently, completely differently. And he gave really full license to do that. Mm -hmm. And a few examples of how we did it was typically the way that you would go about launching a team would be to write a really long deck, spend ages thinking about the mission, articulating the vision, putting the strategy on one page that nobody can read in an auditorium and just doing all those things, writing really detailed roles and responsibilities and process mapping documents, um, really going into the detail of telling people how, how they need to do that, what they were going to do. And instead, the approach that we took was instead thinking about the values that we want the team to be built on. And I'm going to struggle to remember all of them now, but they were <laughs> things such as um always in beta so we're, we're testing things we're not sure how this is going to go and and that's okay the second one was greatness but not at all cost mm -hmm. and I think that was a really powerful one because you know often especially the language of sales is extreme extremely aggressive and it's very difficult to think about mental health and well-being alongside hitting those targets at all costs so we wanted to really externalize that idea of it doesn't have to be at all costs, right? There's a limit at which pursuing something, if it's affecting you in a particular way, isn't worth doing. And I think the third one was it's okay to not be okay to really encourage conversations about mental health um, because it's something that, you know, we know that a lot of the team, one in three people struggle with, yet so few people feel comfortable to bring that, bring awareness to it. Mm -hmm. So I guess you wouldn't necessarily expect those three messages of greatness, but not at all costs. It's okay to not be okay. And always in beta to be the core foundations of a sales team, uh, you know, in a large, very large, successful company. But actually 
building the whole team on those foundations and empowering people to live by those values, but then work things out for themselves rather than being overly prescriptive about it um, was a new way of doing it. And I think that team has continued to have the the highest uh, kind of team satisfaction scores for a long period of time. I don't know whether it changed um, when COVID hit. I think every team probably took a (laughs) note dive at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was just a different, it was a different approach. We we wanted to create a team that was really proud of the values that it was built on um, rather than one that was just rooted in, you know, squares on a page and arrows connecting things that didn't really exist. Because it also implies that you know the answer and it's all predestined. When if you're a new sales team trying to do something that hasn't been done before, there has to be an element of we need to test this and see what our customers actually think first before just mapping it all out. So that was probably the first first manifestation of it. How is that team like received by the rest of Google or like perceived or... Do you know what? I think there was probably a little bit of initial scepticism about it because a lot of the things that other teams would have expected to see probably didn't exist straight away. But I think it was more important to create that that team was comprised of lots of different other bits and teams. And it was really important to stand them up as having their own identity built on those values Mm -hmm. rather than thinking about the, you know, the sales target or the end revenue goal um instead and yeah I think overall to be honest the team performed so well that I think the question was like what can we learn from that team Mm -hmm. rather than you know why haven't they why haven't they done this because you always have to have the basics in place it's just what you choose to talk about at the at the beginning Mm -hmm. right we went into the launch of this team having really having really interesting people come and speak right we have Sam came and spoke we launched Phil launched the team with those values and I remember so specifically when he stood up um and introduced the team when it came to it you know it's okay to not be okay he wobbled a little bit because of his own his own mental health journey that he'd been on and there was actually no greater show of vulnerability vulnerability and leadership that's really powerful to role model than that moment and I think people remember that Um, and there were lots of other things as well but the reality is you have smart people and you have targets and you know that they're going to get achieved it's it's the how you do it as much as what you're doing that's important and that's what we really tried to establish so you took a lot of small and bold actions within google what have you been doing recently with small bold actions so I've taken some quite big, small, bold actions recently, <laughs> um, and I couldn't be happier about them, to be honest. Um, so I, I guess it's probably important that I say I left Google mm-hmm. uh, a few months ago, and now I can very proudly say that I am a CEO of an amazing, very not pirate, but pirate in, in nature, um, music streaming platform called Kiki. I am also the proud owner of a small cafe in West London, um, a brunch cafe. And I'm also running to be elected as a local councillor in my area um, in next year's elections. So it's triple C for me. And if you'd have asked me a year ago if I'd ever be working in a startup, I would have said absolutely not. And if you'd have ever said, would you be the owner of a small business? I would have said absolutely not. But here I am doing those things and I I couldn't feel freer or more happier about that, that decision. Yeah, that's that's an amazing journey. Um, and that really goes into our next question. If you're, uh, you know, running for, um, you know, entering the world of politics, um, our question is, what is the social rebellion that you're looking to start? Or have you started with the work that you're doing? And what do you hope to bring into the world of politics? So I think at a very, so the, the level of politics that I'm hoping to enter is the kind of politics which in, in the UK is local politics and what that really refers to is making sure that streets are clean and that your bins are collected on time, to, uh, discussions about council tax, parking, l- low neighbourhood, tra- no, low um, low traffic zones in particular neighbourhoods, whether you can cut branches making sure leaves are cleared up like it's really the kind of things that impact people's day-to-day lives not versus but as opposed to perhaps national politics that you know an MP might be more involved in and of course it all adds up but 
I think the the social rebellion that I'm starting that I'm trying to change actually first and foremost is that it's really important for normal people to get involved and participate in democracy in some way and I don't really mind which party people put themselves forward mm-hmm. um put, put get involved with but it's more that what I've seen is that it's quite difficult to be involved because at an early stage it can feel like unless you devote your entire life to it all the time you can't get involved and can feel a little bit uh, exclusive in some way and actually I've one of the driving forces for me persevering is one being it harnessing that sense of this feels difficult I should probably keep doing it Mm -hmm. secondly I have a belief that there should be people who look like you who don't look like you but that seem approachable and don't just seem like the kind of people that you would typically associate with politics who are getting involved with how democracy works and that's the driving force for me staying involved and also to be really um I don't know to be really specific about it spending the last 18 months at home working from home as many many people have done and and I'm very fortunate to live you know live in a developed country but the things that do impact you on a day-to-day basis are the things that exist around your neighborhood and there are so many wonderful examples of where people pulled together during covid and there was a sense of community and neighborliness that i think i really want to promote i think i went um i went and did a case visit the other day with somebody and the impact that somebody who's a counselor can have through sending an email to a housing authority or trying to request some bins or organizing a community clear up in somebody's local you know alleyway that they're having difficulty accessing for example is so powerful and for me that's incredibly motivating and perhaps one of the key shifts that has happened is I think about the complexity of the world that I lived in in terms of the complexity of the business model that is Google and Kiki is also complex in some ways but let's put that to one side the the cafe that I own is a very simple model you buy ingredients you cook it people eat it and feel really happy and then they go away it's very simple it's it like it sparks joy and that's great similarly the things that you can do at a local level to improve people's quality of life the things that bug them every day to encourage people to be hopeful to help each other out to go to the local library or create a community trust to save a local library that can then become a hub for the community I think they're things that are really important and should be championed and people must be able to participate in democracy alongside their alongside full-time roles it's so important to infuse that fresh thinking um diversity of thought into politics and I think you know all politics all all politics could benefit from that especially now Mm -hmm. yeah um what ultimately would you like to see um happen within politics gosh it brought, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what things would I like to see happen broadly within politics I would like to see I would like to see action being taken on the environment as opposed to it being used as a political tool. Um, I would like to see... greater representation at all levels of politics. Um, What else would I like to see? I mean, there are so so many (laughs) social issues. I would like to see, you know, continued. I'd like, I feel quite strongly that developed markets should set set an example for the rest of the world in terms of, um, you know, yeah, promote, making sure that the environment is well cared for and making sure that we're supporting developing countries to be able to, um, you know, transition to green technologies in order to help them, help them accelerate their movement to green technologies. I would like to ensure that we are continuing to support other countries and making sure that the first thing to be cut when business, when um, countries are having a difficult time in their own economy is not foreign cuts to foreign aid. Um, I would like to see continued support and awareness for um, the safety of women. We've just recently had another young woman in in London um, murdered. And I know that a lot of friends and 
you know, the entire female and non-male community feel very triggered and threatened by that at the moment. I think we need to continue to raise awareness around um, safety on safety on the streets and, um, you know, how how people how everyone can be better allies in that role. I guess there's quite a broad spectrum of like things that are national policy level um, all the way down to things that, are, you know, affect people's day to day lives. But um, overall, I don't think any of those things are too controversial. <laughs> and I'm also, I probably am not the, not the right person to be uh, saying I'm not part of the Ravy Looney. I can't remember the, the name of that party or anything like too, <laughs> too wild. Um, uh, I think it's, it's important that we, you know, we make sure that we have a, from a UK perspective, have a, have an economy that supports best in class technology. That is a, cre- like really supports the creative industries um, and also in turn has a, you know, a social welfare system that makes sure that the, you know, the most vulnerable in society are well, well protected um, and supported. So they're probably the, you know, my, my uh, top level views on politics <laughs> without being too specific about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when you were um, getting started with, um, you know, creating good trouble and um, starting your pirate journey, did you have some like uncomfortable questions that you asked yourself when you were getting started that helped you get started along the way? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I think I referenced this in how to be more pirate, actually. But, you know, it's easy to talk a good game. Right? Even now I can happily say I feel like I'm really living my pirate truth by, I've, you know, I've become a CEO, I'm owning the cafe, I'm running for councillor. And the journey to it has been really horrible and mm-hmm. difficult and lonely and scary and anxiety um, fueled. Um, and I went through a really, it was a really difficult period. I, I would almost describe it as um, a kind of grieving of the identity and future that I had imagined on my corporate career path at Google um, and lots of the other, lots of other associated things. I'd, yeah, I just really, um, I had to become okay with that. And I think I, every part of my brain tried to wrestle with the decision of leaving um, and as I said, ultimately, I feel like it's the right decision. But all the, all the you know, the whole way along, I, there's another example that I, I could give, which is when I was at Google trying to cause good trouble, one of the things I was responsible for was um, driving up our customer satisfaction score. So how, how satisfied our customers were with us in terms of the results from our advertising and the, the results from our media and, and their relationships with people at, at Google. And... Um, instead of doing the normal, you know, we'll do this strategy, we'll send an email. I was like, no, we need to create a campaign where it's unmissable for people to understand that every thought and action needs to start with the customer. And we had this big metaphor around, you know, walking in your customer's shoes. So one Friday, I think it was before the launch of this new campaign where I had people, customers coming in to speak, because, you know, if we're talking about customers, we should probably invite customers in to tell us what they're actually thinking rather than having Google employees talking about what they think their customers want because it's in, in, inherently biased to ask people who are you know representing their customers to talk about what they think they want um so had lots you know had lots of banners campaigns themes targets competitions all kinds of great things that like my goal is we, we almost we want to assume email doesn't exist and we need pe- this to be unmissable so in my wanting to be more pirate i went and bought a load of shoes um, to represent, you know, walking in customer shoes. And in the um, the key food area within Google, which is a real like watering hole for everyone because the food at Google is amazing and everyone gathers there for lunch and sits and eats at the table, I'm sure you've all seen. Um, I, with a group of others, but completely directed by me, started to tie shoes up everywhere above the above the tables right on the kind of this not scaffolding but the pipes and stuff that's mm-hmm. above to create this kind of installation of shoes hanging down because there was lots of messaging around walking in people's shoes so it must have been about six o'clock seven o'clock on 
on a Friday night and people started walking past and were like laughing and I didn't understand I was like oh what's what's so funny and they were like oh well don't you know that you know if, if their shoes tied up on a tree it means that, like that's where you can get drugs from it shows that you know it's a drug deal is going down and I was like <laughs> are you joking and they said, no, no. and then somebody else walked past again great ad- this is a kind of great advertisement for uh, diversity of thought and diversity of teams somebody else came and said oh did you know that in Japan that actually signifies that a suicide took place in 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 that location so there were lots of like negative or unexpected connotations of me aerially hanging shoes up in this area to illustrate a point so I of course spent all of the weekend really wor- worrying whether that was going to be the mass reception of this and should I take it down? Am I going to get fired? What will happen or not? And, um, you know, on Monday, everyone came in and, lo- you know, loved it. And the conversation luckily was not around what I represented. I think people understood it. But um, I guess the reason I use that story is because that weekend felt awful, right? I felt sick to my stomach the whole time. I wasn't sure if I'd made a massive mistake, if I absolutely humiliated myself and trying to do something in a different way. And, you know, would I have done it again? I don't know, probably not if I'd have, if I'd have understood that, but um, do I regret that ambition that I had to try and affect change within an organization where there's so much, you know, stagnancy or a a sense of what's expected and that this has been done before, um, no, I'm glad that I tried to do that. And again, I know that if Alex were here, she would be like, you can't affect change within large corporations. They're just trying to make profit and they're evil and don't worry about it. <laughs> um, we've had lots of discussion about it. But I think in my own way at that point in time, doing things in a different way was almost just like a test bed for different levers of behavior change, which is I think what I mean, what as a as a person I'm really interested in, what what motivates people to change, whether that be being in a new sales team, how you get people to focus on a customer beyond the basic set of levers like core sales information or financial targets or getting paid Mm -hmm. I just think there's so much more to there's so humans are so much more nuanced than that and if you can you know communicate in a slight in a more engaging way then there are kind of great there's great upside to be had but the reason I say that is because the journey of being a pirate can feel horrible you might constantly feel on the precipice of getting fired because you're trying to do something different difficult you constantly have that like slightly lurchy feeling in your stomach even when you're thinking should I ask somebody like what they actually meant by that or call you know call somebody out on something or or put forward a potentially unpopular opinion but over time I've learned to yeah use that as a use that as a signal that I should say something and now I I don't hate that feeling quite as much as I got used to it similarly I as I said like making the transition from being in corporate to running my own business and all this other stuff is absolutely terrifying like going into politics is especially as as what well, going into politics for anyone is difficult there's a lot of horrible stuff on the internet and I'm absolutely terrified about that but I also think it's better to I want to stick my head above the parapet that for me is what being be more pirate is all about is having the courage to put your head above the parapet in in your efforts to try and drive change and and that's what I'm trying to do I I love the facts in that story like we talk about it all the time here is you know taking action and not being afraid of making mistakes right um because we all we all make mistakes First thing you said when you talked about the shoes, hang. I used to be a police officer. I'm like, oh, that's where they, that's where they're going to sell the drugs in, in the cafe. That's cool. Everybody knows that's where you get your Google drugs. <laughs> um, but you know, we still, you know, if we if we don't take any action, then we, how do you affect any change, right? Um, we we all make mistakes, and I think um, one of the things that we can learn from those mistakes is that it's not as bad as you thought it was going to be, right? Like you didn't get fired, nothing bad happened, right? Um, and so I really love uh, the fact that you told that story, um, and yet you know you took that action, um, and I hope knowing what you would know that you would still take that action. <laughs> yeah. There are, there are other times where again and I have referenced this before but there are times where it does fail right like there was a time where there was a diversity equity and inclusion plan that I just didn't think was particularly good and I felt empowered and didn't see hierarchy enough to go and speak to the managing director of 
their entire business about this and um you know they were kind enough to hear me on it but actually I didn't I probably didn't formulate my views either I didn't formulate my views in the best way or it wasn't that it wasn't the message that wanted to be heard and I felt terrible coming away from it I didn't I didn't have um I didn't get the feedback of thank you so much for bringing this to my awareness I'm like I, it must have taken a lot for you to want to say something about this and I felt awful like I, I still don't feel good about that conversation um you know I think our relationship overall is good and I think I felt strong enough to be able to you know appreciate that I might lose a bit of credit in raising the concerns that I did have with it but it was yeah it was it was not it was not positive in any way and I just I I think it is really important to not over glamorize being more pirate because as an individual you do feel like you're constantly pushing and out on a limb and sometimes you're like oh gosh like why do I have to make life so difficult for myself all the time Mm -hmm. um but actually the people who are doing it are incredibly brave and also if you're not doing it then you're also brave too it just Mm -hmm. means that maybe there's a small step that you can take when you feel in a more comfortable situation I appreciate that all of the small bold decisions that I'm making come from an immense perspective of privilege, right? The, I have of course worked out that the, the, what's the worst thing that can happen is that yes, I do get fired, but that doesn't mean that I'm then homeless and have a family to support, Mm -hmm. right? It's a very, I, I, I do also think that there's a level of privilege attached to being more pirate in some situations. And if you're not able to make small, bold actions now, then that there might be a good reason for that. And you have to do what's right for you in your situation because you will be constantly doing that risk assessment. Mm-hmm. Um, there are other ways that you can do it through showing people kindness, being there for other people, being an activist in your own life, which might mean upholding a system that you don't agree with, but it's what you need to do to survive at that point in time. So I just wanted to mention that because obviously I'm, I am in a, I recognize the the privileged perspective that I'm in in order in order to take these risks and they're not you know they're not even particularly big risks generally but to me in my personal experience they felt like risks for my own journey. That's that's a really good point too because I've thought like with the risks I've taken I'm like what's the worst that could happen? I, I have places where I can fall back. Um ultimately even without a job I I could go stay with my parents. I could do what this thing. So yeah, there is a, for me also an area of privilege in, in this. And though there are also little actions that people can take. Um, even if it's like, I need this job because I don't have that privilege and I need to be able to pay my bills and do this. So in that, like taking those steps toward, um, those little steps of rebellion, do you have any recommendations for those people that are like, I really want to see change. And I don't have that privilege, um, ways, small steps that they can take, um, small actions or even words of advice for those people. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I, first of all, I just like to yeah, I think I, I can't take away the privilege that mm. like, blurs my lens on it. So I wouldn't say it's advice, but the types of things I would offer as thoughts would be one is to not beat yourself up about not doing anything at this point in time. Like I think awareness is the first acknowledging, acknowledging acknowledgement or awareness is the first step to driving that change. I think there becomes a point where, and, and maybe you can both relate to this where like, the pirateness does leak out of you at points like you can't help once something once that desire for change is awakened within you mm-hmm. it actually becomes quite physiological right you can't particularly help it whether it's like asking somebody to pick up a piece of litter or having a conversation with somebody who looks like they're having a bit of a tough time or taking small bold actions you know sometimes the I think two things I would say is sometimes a small bold action can be showing yourself a kindness that you're not doing Another small, bold action could be extending a kindness to somebody else, which again, costs nothing and doesn't have to be in the realm that you want to affect change in. Mm -hmm. I I guess I, this probably is, doesn't align with the core messaging of this podcast, but I just, it doesn't always have to be immediate. And sometimes it takes time, right? It can, it can build up over time and also, you know, working to secure the, 
family either the safety of your, yourself or your family is like the most courageous bold act so I'd probably just start by, <laughs> start by um, saying not to be not to beat yourself up about it and then secondly I imagine it it, it does just happen over time you start to spot those things everywhere um, and thirdly if you don't feel like you can affect change in the area that you're spending a significant proportion of your time if it's your work then think about where you can do that outside of your core occupation because that energy will fuel you. The ability to see the impact of your small board actions will fuel you within your current, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this, if, if, the, if there was a desire to change organization, but you felt stuck, then I would say, first of all, look outwards, like look at, look at what else you can do so that you're not focused so much on, uh, the pressure isn't just building up on, on your core work. Mm -hmm. um, I think some something that I recognized in myself is that when you're feeling very when you're feeling very disengaged it's easy to just think like I'm really tired I don't want to do anything but actually thinking about where you can get energy from giving your time to other people again I, I say this from I, I don't think this answers your previous question but from my world when I was feeling the most drained unhappy demotivated you know depressed burnt out uh, I would I would mentor other people um, because it it like it was the thing that fueled me and nourished me that I wasn't getting from my my job at that point in time. That that answers it very well. Um, yeah, having those little tangible um, things that people can do because we do talk about the big actions, but there are also those small actions that anybody can take, which ultimately is is the core of what we um the heart of why we want to have these conversations so yeah thank you <laughs> and I think in, there actually, oh sorry, sorry I was gonna on. say and I think in the way you know society is kind of constructed right now I think self-care is an act of piracy mm -hmm. um there's there's many days where I don't feel very pirate um as I slog along in my you know doing my own work um and, you know, that act of rebellion, rebellion for me is, is taking care of myself, even if that's, you know, uh, a 10 minute bath or, you know, taking some time out um, alone, sitting in my car in the driveway, <laughs> with decompressing before I come back in the house. There are those small um, uh, acts of self-care that really are a rebellion. And, and I think in this day and age. I love that. I think that's, I think that's so right. And I, I, there are other, there are other things that you can do right quietly that have impact. You can, you can of course like write letters to your like local counselors or politicians try and affect chain. There are also just, you know, small things that, that you can do like um, asking people if they're okay today, who you don't know, or posting a chocolate bar through someone's letterbox who's not having a good time. Like, I mean, I, I just think there are lots of ways to have, have outsized impact on people's lives in, in quite simple and often free way as well, writing a letter, speaking to somebody, whatever you feel like you have energy for. And I love that point. Something that my husband says all the time is his core role um, that as a, he's the CEO of his company and he says his, his main job is to manage his own psychology as a leader. And I think that's a really interesting way of putting, it's a kind of the other side of the coin to what you were saying around making sure that you are in a stage where you can support what well, that you can that you're feeling like mentally fit and healthy and then that you can go on and support other people I think yeah something that I have I've talked to Alex and Sam a lot about is just you have to well I think it's important to de-glamorize pir piracy as these big bold takeover acts that you know sometimes people don't aren't in a financial position to risk losing their job over speaking out over some kind of injustice right it's just not available to everyone all the time and good for the people who do like we need those people but there are also people who can't who, who can't do that so we have to think about what the small quieter but more important acts of driving that change might be whether it be being there for the person who has done that or you know using your um using your platform for good that's something i really value whether it be offering your help to other people writing letters signing petitions there are so many ways to, you could be active active and passively activist i think <laughs> as well if that makes sense mm -hmm. and so um what does we talked a lot about good trouble so what does good trouble mean to you Oh, what does good trouble mean to me? I 
hope you guys can't hear my dog snoring in the background. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> I was trying really hard not to start laughing, but is that Benny snoring? That's Benny snoring. Yeah. He's, on my, he's under my desk. What kind of dog is he? He's a old chunky little Cavalier King Charles and he's Aww. just snoring under my desk. And I'm like, wow, I can hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope all you can't. Uh, something I to know. add to the blooper rules. <laughs> My dog dreams in uh, while I'm on meet, meeting. So like, I don't know if your dog makes it sound, but he's like, he's quite small and he goes like, <laughs> <laughs> like in the corner. And it's the cutest thing. And I almost need to be like, stop my dog's dreaming. I need yeah, to listen. Can we all listen? Um, but he's not sleeping now. He's probably terrified. <laughs> my husband. Um, okay. So your question was, what does good, good trouble. trouble look or feel like? For me, I th- for me, a good a big component of good trouble has to be rooted in action. Something that I don't love is echo chambers of words with no action. And I think something that I say a lot, and I'm sure I will not get the saying right, is just that what you know, words without action are just entirely useless. Um, so I think having said that there are like lots of small bold actions for me protesting on just protesting purely in the form of social media for example doesn't feel like fully good trouble it feels like an indication of it it feels like intent you know you're signaling your intention to cause good trouble by showing an awareness of the issue and you're using your platform to try to create awareness of that thing but beyond that share that external signal is there anything else that you might be able to do to either be better informed yourself or to actually drive some change um and again I don't want to get judgmental it's not for me to pass judgment over how people engage with things but I think for me good trouble always has to be rooted in action or change um that comes about from it and the way that I know that it's happening is when it feels slightly risky or I feel a bit nervous about it but do it anyway um I'm trying to think about what specific thing what specific good trouble looks like I think it, I don't know I'm not I don't I don't have a good answer for this question because for me it's so rooted in the context and it being slightly unexpected but cha- unexpected challenging people's perceptions about how something has to be done or challenging their perceptions about an issue and And also, I think results in an overarching sense that when people try to do something, then change happens. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know that's quite generic and broad, so I'm not really sure. <laughs> what? Tell me what a good aunt, What are the best answers <laughs> compared to what good trouble looks like? You know, I don't think we've actually asked it before. No. <laughs> You're the first one we decided to ask this. Up. Yeah. <laughs> we have a low bar now. Is <laughs> well, the only like this the story from my personal life that like that comes to mind when I talk about good trouble um, and like is you know kind of relative to what we're talking about Um, there was a time where um, I was working with a group of people who were trying to get um, uh, certain pesticides banned from uh, from from use in just in in a in a city here locally and um, you know, one of the things that we did was uh, create a petition that we were going to present to the city council. Um, and in order to get signatures for the petition, we would show up to a lot of different community events, um, different parks and um, things. And the pretty much every time we would get escorted out um, by the city people or who at whomever, because um, they didn't want us, um, you know, I don't know, I guess, bothering the people while they're at these, these community events um, and getting these, um, the signatures. Um, so that to me was, was causing good trouble, right? Like it was trouble because, you know, they, want, they didn't want us there. We got escorted out, um, but it was good trouble because, you know, the use of these pesticides on people's lawns are, were causing um, issues with the environment. Um, so that to me was like one that just 
popped to mind uh, when we were talking about creating good trouble because mm-hmm. I'm very much always been a very uh, like rural follower and to for me to get escorted you know off the property multiple <laughs> times while protesting and trying to get signatures for this local um, local th- environmental issue that that was um, important to me um, yeah that that's my good trouble story <laughs> that's cool I like that I don't think I'm I just don't think I'm bold and I don't think I've done anything that I've had to be escorted out of anything <laughs> yes <Me either. laughs> that's yeah. what we have to add to the end of it yes yeah. but I feel yeah. like well I think also the other again I'm, I know I'm not answering the question very well but there's things to me that are signals of good trouble is when you meet people who you wouldn't have met otherwise and you're united by that sense of wanting to create that change mm-hmm. um and another like another symptom of good trouble is I think people starting to talk about it who are outside of that circle so if like a discussion starts to happen then it gets to a point where my dad would start being like well what's all of this stuff about Mm -hmm. I'm like yes it's made it into the mainstream it's not (laughs) staying within the echo chambers of people who already know about it and now we can have a discussion and try and change change a view on it. So that's um, that's I think what good trouble looks like. Also, from again, I guess I'm. I think I'm not going to shy away from talking about the corporate examples because that's what's in the book. I'm not pretending here to be a Greta Thunberg of my time. Um, <laughs> Me neither, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, something that happened after I left was you know, or something that happened after that was people were like, we need to make it like the launch of that team was. You know, that was like the new standard. Or mm. how would Crystal? You know, well, how would Crystal approach this? thing or how can we be more pirate about it like just became part of the vocabulary Mm -hmm. and I think that for me was like a sign that um things were changing a little bit and that there was like a legacy of like a new way of doing things that had stuck a little bit Mm -hmm. and then obviously those things tried to be replicated and never have quite lived up to it but I think that's because it requires a bit of imagination and my approach on everything work related is that or and, and life related is you know you should never assume that people are behaving in a particular way or holding views because they're stupid or because they're lazy but instead always seek to be curious about why they have that perspective what's incentivizing them within the organization to work in that kind of way what incentive structures are in place for managers to continue to support a negative culture or um, bad workplace practices or not actually promoting well-being despite it being something that's talked about all the time well the company structures are incentivizing that kind of behavior and once you start to understand those things, you can create a strategy which is based on those actual levers for change, as opposed to assuming if you start sending, if you send more emails of the same thing, that change will actually happen. So that's, you know, that's something that's that's really important to me in in, in creating change within businesses. And and actually, one of the things I think I should have mentioned earlier is that something that I do, and and part of the question around why how how being pirate has manifested itself for me is there hasn't been a point where I guess I wanted to not go out and be full pirate because again I'm putting a judgment on it but Mm -hmm. I do really believe that you have to be inside in order to create that change and that for me is like the most powerful way of using myself to create the change that I want to see so it's scary to be involved in politics being standing in one political party over another one will be unpopular but I could be scared of that and not stand for election and not stick my head above the parapet and not try to change from within Mm -hmm. Um, or I can you know or I can do it and it's the same with working within corporates right it's always appealing to go and work in like the the challenger brand and I am now doing that by the way and so again there's no judgment but I also think it's very powerful to use when you're in a when you have a platform or you're in a business of that size, you can use your platform well and create a lot of change um, it positively there as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah, my justification for being a corporate pirate, <laughs> an establishment pirate or a pirate within the Navy. And those corporate pirates are are very important because when like when you're talking about it, I keep remembering Google used to be pirate. Um, Apple used to be pirate, Mm -hmm. like big corporations now at one point in time started off as little pirate um, companies that were making great changes and asking those good questions. So to have like, as those brands grow and get bigger, it's very important to have the corporate pirates. So 
all the pirates that are in the corporation that are speaking up and going against the status quo, we need you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Mm-hmm. Definitely. But then, but also I have to say that I feel so liberated having, having left that environment because there is a point in time where it, yeah, you know, where challenge something that Sam actually, <laughs> something that Sam used to describe how I was, I think it was, I must have been December 2019. Um, I actually was so burnt out from work that I um, I had shingles, which is quite rare when you're quite young and healthy. Um, and he was like, it sounds like you're getting up every day and you're running against a brick wall mm-hmm. <laughs> and the brick wall is not going to move. Mm-hmm. I was like, yes, that is correct. The point at which I'm physically my body is physically saying you can't do this anymore I should probably listen and of course I didn't I continued for another two years um so I'm not saying that I had this this great moment that my body was telling me my friends around me could see it but I you know I didn't listen um and I had to come to that decision in my own time um but yes I agree you're right that it's 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 what it's the importance of culture and fostering fostering an important fostering a culture that um that evolves and I think probably once you get you know the whole saying I'd rather be a pirate than join the navy is from Steve Jobs from Mm -hmm. Apple Mm -hmm. so I think there might be a you know it might be once you get to a certain size or unless you uh completely transform the paradigm of people managers um then that shift won't change and it's something that I was endlessly frustrated with was you speak to people managers and all they would do is complain about being a people manager. Like you really, you wouldn't want to be a people manager. It's so awful having to manage people and doing all this recruitment and hiring and performance managers. And there are people who spend their, all of their free time, you know, imbibing books about personal development, how to have great career conversations, how to be a great coach who want nothing other than to develop people because that's something that they're really interested in and they could do so much in terms of creating movement all around the organization to do it and yet you know because people don't leave those systems are so stuck in place that change doesn't happen and it is just very frustrating you don't really get that change and then I think if you think of think about the last 18 months as businesses were in more kind of um sustain mode or hibernation what was the easy thing to do to when it came to hiring? Well, we'll hire somebody else who's done the same role at another business, mm-hmm. right? We'll look to another tech firm and see if they've had the same title and we'll bring them in. And again, that just means that you're not bringing in those, you know, the squiggly career journeys, the bring, bringing people in from different industries that can then really transform the way that you're thinking about something. Having true diversity of thought within organizations through the way that you're hiring and recruiting and sourcing people has not happened has not happened so much mm-hmm. um but I, I'm sure we'll be on the on the up again now <laughs> and where can our listeners go to find out more about you um that's a good question I would mm-hmm. say I'm not important enough to have a dedicated <laughs> source of information about myself mm-hmm. um but they're welcome to follow my personal Instagram account just to see photos of my dog. Um, <laughs> the most exciting thing. Sold. Um, yeah. <laughs> it is sold, I have to say. He's so cute and I'm obsessed with him. So yeah, if you want, if you want dog, it, yeah, I would say my Instagram mainly comprises of like be more pirate quotes, um, be more pirate quotes and dog photos and photos of Jennifer Lopez just being awesome <laughs> and quotes from the squiggly careers podcast which I also love um that is yeah that's what you can that's the kind of high quality content <laughs> and probably kind of you know ruthless honesty about the ups and downs of uh of making that change I think something that I'm really keen to do is make sure that it doesn't seem like a success story I think so often you are told to it, so often it's easy to say, well, how did you get to this point in life? And it's like, well, I always wanted to be a CEO and I spent six years at Google and then I got this amazing opportunity. Whereas actually the story is so different to that and it isn't linear and it's not what I wanted it to be or expected it to be. And that doesn't in any way detract from how happy and fulfill I, fulfilled I feel right now. Um, but it's just really important to know, to know that 
the, it's it's so difficult to convey the lows of the journey and I think we all just have a duty to do that is to keep reminding like yes being 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 associated being more pirate and bravery and courage and being someone who brings people together and acts as a force for change is really powerful but the flip side of that is talking about the times where you just think why am I so difficult like why do I always have to make work for myself why do I feel this constant sense of nervousness or anxiety but I have to say doing Sam's latest program called the uncertainty experts has been a real driver in helping me channel that feeling of nervousness into you know positivity and fuel for doing the right thing which is probably an evolution of what I was saying around when things don't feel quite right you should you should do them uh anyway within reason Mm -hmm. Um, so people can find me on at crystal maze on instagram and on linkedin and generally happy to connect and if i can ever help um in any in any area then uh and get in touch i'm really happy to do that awesome yeah and how would you recommend our listeners go about starting their own pirate life well i'd start by start by reading the book mm. <laughs> a good start genuinely I think properly read it rather skim it doesn't take very long you could probably read it in an hour um read the book I think listening to some of the brilliant guests that you've had on this podcast is is like a really good second step to be honest because there was always that gap and I think that's why this is so brilliant because it's like well it sounds cool to be more pirate but like how do you actually do that and how do I put that into my career plan or how do I make the change to do it so I think uh, yeah listen to a few episodes based on what you're interested in or choose the episode that you're least intuitively interested mm. in and mm. listen to that one um, and then read how to be more pirate and then just go and start it and I think it's one of the start start trying start making good trouble and it can even just start with a small act of kindness do something that is out of the ordinary for you um, whether it be I say the, I say these things because when you're in your kind of in your tunnel vision world of commuting or whatever it might be you sometimes do forget to be a decent human being it, like it does take work to mm-hmm. smile and ask people if they're okay or you know properly understand how to be an ally or how you know how you can be more inclusive in your language all of those things they're small bold actions that you can you can you can take without having to do a huge amount um and then more broadly I think start just start telling people about it right like make it part of your identity um I would say that's been quite transformational for me and I think people now do associate me with that in a small way I don't want to you know I don't want to overstate my pirateness <laughs> but I just think yeah I think like just talk about it use use that as part of your identity use good trouble use you know positively I'm not going to say it's full of swear words, but, you know, like positively (laughs) doing that stuff to make change, say it and, you know, repetition is key. And the more you like flag it to other people, I think then you also attract other pirates too. I think that's been another thing. Like you, you become more confident in being like, I don't know you and we have nothing in common, but I feel like we should hang out. And if we (laughs) spend enough time together, really good things will happen. (laughs) I imagine that's happened with your podcast a bit with the people. Mm -hmm people that you've got to know um but good trouble good people attract good people and I think good trouble attracts good trouble too um and don't don't I would I the other thing I say is like don't be too grandiose about what being more pirate feels like just Mm -hmm. try to take some small bold changes whether it be I don't know not accepting a change that your boss has suggested and, and pushing for why it should stay as it is or if you're in a meeting and you don't think and you think you hear something that you don't think is 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 right just ask somebody sorry what exactly do you what exact not don't say sorry that's the rule number one just say what exactly do you mean by that think about uh how you can you know all of those small things as a starting point are a really good way to do it and I think the other thing as well I always couple I always couple be more pirate with sparking joy I don't know whether that that like my three pillars of values is probably the wrong word but the three components of crystal I would say uh, be more pirate sparking joy and daring greatly like Brene Brown Brown Sam Conniff and Marie Kondo together (laughs) for me are a pretty powerful combination of the the rules that I like to live my life by um another way of doing it could be there's some really great work you can do on your values 
Um, the Squiggly Careers podcast has got a lot on that in terms of career mapping for people who are in more, it's not even more, any any job where you want to think about your career, there's a, a really great template and exercise on how to identify your values. And that's quite core cool to um, be more pirate, right? What are the things that you're willing to fight for? Mm-hmm. And I personally found that exercise quite hard, if I'm honest, when I was asked to do it, like, because when I was in workshops, I, people would say really, really bold, big things. But that is also a, a different way of approaching the same thing. Um, what are the things that you're willing to, to fight for and, and start from there in terms of how you spend your free time, if you have the luxury of having any or, you know, where you donate or um I, yeah any any of that kind of stuff where you travel you know like I think it's just about taking action making sure authenticity is when your external belief your internal belief system aligns with your actions so for me all of this stuff boils down to are you acting in a way that's aligned with the the things that you're willing to fight for mm-hmm. if they pull in different directions and you kind of just end up in stasis so yeah mm-hmm. I hope that's, hope that's in some way useful yeah very um okay last question it's a long one today Kristen we can see first (laughs) okay oh yeah so Crystal (laughs) do you know any pirate jokes oh okay I have to say I I do think I'm a bit of a pun queen I don't know jokes but I could definitely do like puns for a long time excellent (laughs) well I mean you uh okay I'll start now so um you fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> you need to you need to spar with me here. I can't, <laughs> I, can't have, I can't come up with pirate jokes. <laughs> like we have we uh, have yeah. one in reserve if you'd like. <laughs> I need to I just need to drop in one one that I'm trying to remember now, which isn't a pirate joke, but it's um Oh, I can't remember it now. No, please tell me your joke. I need all the help. <laughs> okay, okay. It's a long one. This is the longest one we've had. Okay. Okay. So a pirate... Oh, wait, is... I remember it. Oh, okay, okay. good. It's, it's, <laughs> not, like, I don't know. No, it's in no way related to... Uh, it's in no way related to pirates. Very oh, sure. Go for it. <laughs> I don't know why it came to my mind, but um, how do you make Lady Gaga cry? How? Poker face. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I went there. I think it's because I think Lady Gaga is a bit of a pirate, and I she's love that. definitely a pirate. She came I, into my head at that point. Are gonna, I, never, I would never want to poke her amazing face. No. <laughs> are we counting that one, Kristen? Mm-hmm. Or do you want that me to read counts. the you journal? The, the, uh, the novel we have here. <laughs> that one counts. It's a good one. Okay, good. Okay, tell me your one. Okay. You want to read it? I can. I have, I have, okay. I'm working on my pirate voices. So, okay. <laughs> okay. so a pirate and a sailor were exchanging stories. The sailor pointed to the pirate's peg leg and asked, how did you get that? The pirate said, I, I wrestled the shark and lost my leg. The sailor pointed to the shark's hook and asked, how'd you get that? The pirate said, I, I fought Blackbridge crew and lost me hand. The sailor pointed to the pirate's eye patch and asked, how did you get that? The pirate said, I, a bird came by and left droppings in me eye. The sailor said, that's not as impressive as the other two. I, the pirate answered, it was me first day with the hook. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. I just need to go longer <laughs> and then I can get the pirate voice. <laughs> good. I think the pirate voice was good. It's a great like. job. Yeah, I have a hard time with the little ones like the R. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Well done. Well Thanks. read. That was very good. Are we now? I think we now need to have an outro to a sea shanty of some sort. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> awesome. Well, this has been so much fun, Crystal. Um, so thank you for joining us and sharing your pirate journey with us. Thank you. It's been so great to be here. Thank you for what you're doing because honestly, the the bridge between wanting to be more pirate in your life and actually making those changes uh, is really hard. So I really appreciate that you're the kind of the compendium to the how to be more pirate manual and sharing real stories of how people are doing it. So it's such an important bridge and sharing stories big and small mm-hmm. is um, is really important uh, in, in furthering the mission of us, all of us pirates. So thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's rock and roll, guys. There are no rules. This one goes to 11. <laughs>